Garrett McQueen here. Thanks so much for tuning in to this Triloquy replay. The team likes to take a little break every 50 opuses. That's a lot, 50 opuses, you know. It's very important to avoid burnout and all that sort of thing. So we'll be back with a brand new opus of Triloquy in two weeks. Be sure to stay tuned for that. I'm not going to leave you completely empty-handed this week, though. We have a nice replay coming up. And I also thought I'd let you know about some of the other bits of uh, so-called classical music decolonization that's going on out in the world. First and foremost, the one and only Giovanna Joseph of New Orleans is presenting 500 years musicians and composers of African descent in classical music and opera. That's on Thursday, May 20th at 6.30 p.m. Central. Huge shout out to Giovanna Joseph and everyone down there in New Orleans. Maybe you've been keeping up with the saga surrounding the Eastman School of Music and Mr. Jasanti Henry. Well, the school's Black Student Union Union is doing the work to deal with the problem of being black in public, as it were sometimes for us, if you know what I mean. Huge shout out to Mr. Henry for your uh, continued safety and to everyone up there doing the good work over at Eastman. Shout out to the Black Student Union over there. And finally, the International Contemporary Ensemble and Dr. Naomi Andre are hosting the Afro Diasporic Opera Forum online May 26th through 28th. That's in conjunction with Fringe Arts and and Opera Omaha. I'll put information about all of those events and initiatives in the description of this replay. This Triloquy replay is made possible in part by the Schubert Club. Huge thanks to everyone over there for continuing to support the work. I really appreciate it. If you would like to support Triloquy, you can do that on the Triloquy website, T-R-I-L-L-O-Q-U-Y dot O-R-G. Thank you so much. So as you may know, this is Asian American Heritage Month, this month of May. There are lots of conversations about how China, Japan, maybe even Korea are centered when we talk about uh, the celebration of Asian heritage and Asian American heritage. But it's really important to recognize India as a very important part of this celebration as well. During season one of Triloquy, Scott and myself had the pleasure of learning about not only an Indian instrument, specifically a South Indian instrument called the Veena. Nirmala Raja Sekhar and her friend Bupati joined us for a little conversation and a little music, a little improvisation. I know some of you may not have been here for season one, so I wanted to make sure I gave this really great bit of content some room during our little Triloquy break here. Again, thank you so much for your continued support of Triloquy. I will see you again here next week for one more replay before we start season three of the Triloquy podcast. For now, here's our feature of Nirmala and Bupati from season one. Namaste. Namaste. Vanakkam, as we say in Tamil. Okay. <laughs> say say that again for me. Vanakkam. Barakam. I'm going to do my best today. I'm, I'm going to butcher a lot of pronunciations. I'm sorry. I think you do always a fabulous job. So. Oh. <laughs> well, uh, the, the first thing I wanted to uh, sort of talk about before we really dig into the topic um, is the idea of being this cultural representative. So for me, you know, uh, as, as a black musician, people always want me to speak for black musicians. And uh, I, I'm sure, you know, with something as unique as the music the two of you play, you maybe that's a part of uh, what you've experienced in the past as far as your presentations and interviews. I'm curious. Yes and no, um, not in a big way, but definitely in some ways, as soon as they particularly see me with my instrument, mm. that provokes a lot of questions and interesting questions because it's quite unique when you play a 2,000-year-old instrument wow. and you yeah. travel with it. And for me, it's an absolute honor and privilege to play something that's that old. And yet, that's something that's thriving and so dynamically developing over the years, because it's certainly not in the shape and form it was 2,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. So yes, you're right. I do get asked about uh, coming from the East Indian, South Indian, if I may, cultural uh, tradition and playing an instrument and living in the United States of America in Minnesota. You know, all these are tremendous areas uh, for opening up and sharing, because many times we find when people play Indian classical music, they are, if they live in the States, which is rare itself, when you're a professional, you kind of live in your country uh, sure. where you're trying to put yourself on the map. And I am not doing that. So that's the first thing. 
But I have to say I'm blessed to be in Minnesota, and I'm thrilled that this has been my home for 25 years, and I'm able to travel. Otherwise, people settle down on the east or west coast, mm. particularly California and New York, yeah. um, New Jersey, you know, where there's a very big concentration of the East Indian population, if I may. And then Minnesota doesn't figure on that list, at least did not figure on that list. But now Minnesota is a hub hopping with activity in the Indian classical dance and music scene. And we um, we can't even keep up with the number of events that come to town. Mm -hmm. There's so many happening every weekend. And I don't know whether it's that these people that moved in the past 10, 15 years loved the cold particularly, but for <laughs> some reason. Weird. <laughs> many reasons, actually. <laughs> Weird. Um, we have gotten used to uh, seeing a lot of activity. So I've kind of become known for a musician that, that lives in a country far away from India, but mm -hmm. still playing professionally and traveling. And you have to feel incredibly lucky about it. I mean, the yeah. stars must have aligned in a big way. And we always say in the Indian culture, the blessings of your previous generation and elders shower heavily on you. Oh, wow. So the good things that my parents and my grandparents and ancestors and my teachers have all done, we get to bear, you know, have the fruit. The tree was planted a long time ago and they did good things. So I believe I'm getting the benefit of all of that. Wow. You mentioned uh, you mentioned just uh, a few moments ago that you feel blessed yes. to be able to carry on this tradition. And I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about that because I don't know if I've spoken with anyone, any other musicians that talk about their music being a blessing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes, that, yes. So can you talk, uh, both of you, if you could uh, talk a little bit about what it means to carry this music forward. Sure. I say that with absolute uh, truth in every sense of the word, because for a 2,000-year-old oral tradition to survive and thrive, the first thing is the fact that we have the audio oral, oral, mm -hmm. transmission of it from generation to generation. So that is the first thing about Indian classical music. And to receive that, one needs to have the best of the teachers. Mm -hmm. One needs to have the best of the guidance from the home that will take you to the best teachers. So that was a big blessing that I got the best teachers for both vocal, music, and my instrument. So I got to learn from many, many great teachers, performers, and therefore I feel blessed on that account. The second thing is, when I began to study music, yes, I dreamt of being a professional musician from the age of maybe three or four. I would oh, wow. stand on anything that looked remotely like a stage, <laughs> uh, find even a vegetable that looked like a microphone, okay. a long <laughs> cucumber sure. or a goat, snake goat. There's a big... Uh, thing in India, a very long vegetable called the snake gourd, which literally looks like a snake, a long snake. I would hold all of that as microphone cables and sing away to glory or imagine myself. But practically speaking, I went to school, um, took music pri privately, lessons, passed many exams privately, but always went to school, got my master's in systems management and computer science. Oh, nice. Yes, and began a half-done PhD in artificial intelligence in England, thinking naively that I could do both. Be a professional musician, which I began when I was age 13. I played my first solo of about two to three hours concert in Bangalore, India, and then we did all the things anybody would do, like going to school, going to undergrad, grad, and all of that, and thinking I could do both. I really needed a lot of blessing first to be able to carry on my music, having a second office going job. That was a big blessing. Mm -hmm. So I got the opportunities even as I was working. Then to have a family and raise two children. And then finally to leave India and Chennai, which is the hub for South Indian classical music, and go living all over the world, including England and, and Switzerland, and then finally in Minnesota, and still dream of being a musician. Wouldn't you agree? I must have had a lot of blessing Absolutely. to make these dreams come true. Truth. And a lot of people's positive energies supporting me. Some of the blessings that I have to count on my teachers, my parents, of course, my grandpa, my extended family of uncles, aunts, my sister, but my husband, Rod Shaker, who had no clue what hit him when we got married, <laughs> because the poor man thought I was a computer engineer, uh -huh. <laughs> like he was. Yeah. And I'm going to go to office and come home and play the Vina for entertainment, uh -huh. uh, maybe, and for fun. But he never imagined that he was going to go on buses in England carrying this big thing because I had no case for it in those days. I didn't even plan all that. Uh -huh. The universe just gave me 
things as it kept going. And then, of course, to carry it and bring it back from England, which he said he would never do on a ship ever again. And I needed to get a case for it. <laughs> mm -hmm. We brought it back on a cardboard box. I mean, of all things, because oh, wow. I knew nothing more than that at those ages. I was 23 or 24 years old. And then, of course, um, I I learned along the way that things have to fall in place. I still continue to work the job uh, that I did um, and go to work and enjoy my work at the office and do supply chain management and all kinds of things in the computer world. Mm -hmm. Before I said, I'm kind of feeling like I'm shortchanging the children and I'm shortchanging my practice mm, yeah. of music and teaching. I, I loved it that I got up at four and went to bed at 12, but I just felt I still couldn't get enough practice and take care of the kids better. So when my son came into ninth grade, uh, my husband and I, we took this big decision to give up that big job with a big hefty pay packet and go back to music. And the universe blessed me with the Bush Fellowship. I had no yes. idea I would win it that year. That was the same. I quit my job in March. My, I went to my company and said, give me a part-time job. And they laughed and said, each of you are doing two, three people's jobs. Because no, right after no. Y2K, you know, they oh, let course. go a lot yeah. of people. So they said, Normala, go back, take some time off, come back, we'll give you a job. And so I left with that assurance. But then a month later, the Bush Foundation you know, blessed me with that fellowship, which helped substitute somewhat that pay packet that I was not going to get right away. Soon we learned that I could keep doing this, and I was feeling much happier. Um, I was being more of an efficient chauffeur to, to my children because that involved a lot of driving kids around, and didn't um, I didn't feel com like I was compromising them. I was practicing, and and then of course that was about fifteen years maybe ago or fourteen years ago. And I've been since I've made the, a few tours around the country, a few tours around the globe. Mm. And my position in India is becoming um, um, more secure, if I may. But if you can ever call security as a word in the musician's bag. Right, especially as a musician. <laughs> as a yeah. musician. Um, I just hope and pray that I will be blessed to continue playing as long as I'm around. As long as I'm around, I wish I can have most of my hearing Yes. Um, and if possible, my eyesight. Mm. And if possible, the capacity to sit cross-legged and play, if not sit on a chair and play at some point, if I can't sit down. But I really would like to play and sing till the very last minute that, you know, I have to leave the earth. Sounds morbid, but that's truly my dream. And uh, I'm greatly humbled by the support I've received from the community here in Minnesota, around the world, my own home for me mm. to continue this journey. Miles and miles to go before I sleep. I know I'm taking out of Robert Frost, but yes. that used yeah. to be one of my favorite lines. And these woods are dark and deep, particularly when they're snowed down, but yep. I love them. Yes. I love them. Bhupati Ji should probably tell us about his thoughts about it. Could you touch upon your Gurukula a little bit? Actually, same, same thing Nimla said. Uh, I'm very blessed to have this music profession as a Mirdang, Mirdangam artist. Mm -hmm. So from childhood, I'm very passionate about this rhythmic patterns and with the drums. Mm -hmm. So that's why I came to this line. Um, the My instrument called South Indian drum is Mridangam. Mridangam. So it's a king of percussion for the South Indian classical music art form. Mm -hmm. So I'm enjoying my profession. Um, about my childhood uh, and till today, I'm practicing and uh, being with all the artists and playing with them, with my gurus, my teachers, mm -hmm. blessings. I playing with all stalwarts in South Indian classical music, music and also uh, North Indian artists, as well as Western friends. Mm -hmm. Because of uh, Animla, uh, uh, she introduced lot of Western art artists, so to work with them. 
So we collaborate a lot of albums and uh, gigs, mm -hmm. every, everything. So I'm actually, I toured a lot since 1991. Uh, I, I will be out of country about six, seven months. Mm. So, so for the concert tour. And is this in India or, or everywhere? Everywhere, oh, all wow. over the world. Oh, wow. Where, where, uh, where is music is um, happening, mm -hmm. so most probably I will be there. <laughs> <laughs> that's, my, that's my teacher's blessing and Swami's blessing. So, Nirmala said that she was making music with anything she could find when she was young. So, what was your first drum? Was it a pot in the house? That's or? a bench. Bench. Uh, really? I, yeah, that's about, uh, that, uh, you know, Amul. Yeah. <laughs> dub <laughs> box. So, you know, milk, milk powder, dabas, <laughs> everything. Everything. And just I, I stand somewhere else, I just hit something. So, D were, there, were there other uh, musicians in your family to give you your yeah, first yeah, yeah, lessons? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my um, uncles are I all, the, everybody, all the musicians. Yeah. Uh, there is there are it's called Nadaswaram and Tavil. It's a um, traditional uh what what we can say? Temple instruments. Temple instruments. Okay. They are very loud. Nadaswaram is a wind instrument. You will see it um, it's the, open it's air instruments. Open air. Nadaswaram and Tavil. Okay. It's an open air instrument. Traditional uh temples uh uh and marriage there are outdoor it's, instruments yeah. used in temples for services. Now also concert hall. Now they have come into the concert hall. The tavil is a very powerful drum. I mean, okay. it's like the taiko drum in sure, many ways. Yeah. Mm. It's very powerful. And um, they have to wear special um, caps on their fingers, which are made of uh, paste and dried. So it's really strong. And when okay. they play that on one hand and a stick on the other, it's very powerful. The mridangam that Bhubadiyana plays is played with the fingers. There's sure. no extra, you know, uh, accompaniments to his fingers. But there they have a stick on one hand. It's just mind-blowing. And it's very loud. So our outdoors seem to suit really well. But these days they have concerts of these instruments. They are used in marriages. They are used in temple processions. And um, the uncle Arna's uh, uncles were very renowned musicians. Your father was a very well-known movie director and playwright and musician himself. Oh, yeah. nice. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious about, um, you know, uh, we're using this phrase classical music and, and <laughs> Indian classical music. Um, I think I've told you the story. I'll, I'll, I'll tell it uh, very quickly before I entered the, um, the music profession. I worked for a, a cab company, and as I was leaving, the owner of the cab company told me, well, I know a lot about Indian classical music, but not much about Western, so I'm curious to learn more. And that was the first time that a light bulb went off in my mind. Wow, that phrase classical music doesn't just refer to what we Westerners think of as classical music. I'm curious, how do you apply that phrase, classical music? What, what is your opinion uh, on, on the phrase classical music? Thank you for asking, Garrett, because that is uh, sometimes a question that I get asked a lot. Is Indian music folk? Mm. Do you have a mm -hmm. classical? Because classical oh, okay. in the West comes across as a Western tradition. Right, yeah. right. And I didn't realize this for a very long time because I grew up in India and I didn't leave the shores of India till I was 16. But that was my first time when somebody asked me that question because I grew up around Indian classical music. Mm -hmm. When we were little children, the tradition was you take your kids to either dance or music privately or painting or something like that, give them a fine art. But typically it was dance and music. Sure. Classical Indian dance, classical Indian music. This is what families would do for their children, and that's how my induction happened too. So the word classical, I'm asked this a lot too. What do you defi define as classical? I think it's something that's been around for a long time, something that has a very strong grammar, whose rules are fairly strict. Mm -hmm. And I think this can apply to many classical traditions because we have rules, we have grammar, and we've been around for a bit. But the Indian classical tradition did take a lot from the folk. 
There are ragas, which we know. Raga means a melody with a scale going up and down, but basically it's emotion. A raga is an mm. emotion. And South Indian music technically has 34,776 ragas. Holy smoke. <laughs> okay. Yes, but Scott, wouldn't you say we as human beings have much more than 34,776 emotions? Sure. Because a raga that is an emotion, sure. so you're happy, you're somewhat happy, you're very happy, you're greatly happy, you're thrilled. This itself is four ragas, because they're all not the same. So that's what the raga system is. Anyway, I was talking about the raga system, but that's a classical uh, sure. you know, uh, idiom. But ragas came from the folk tradition, so there are some ragas which came from working in the fields and the joy of standing out in the open and transplanting rice. There's a song for that. There's songs for going out fishing on the open seas, and that's a folk. But then those things have come into our concert uh, methodology or, or our com concert repertoire, if you may. And some ragas came in and have become very classical versions of those folk ragas. Anand Bhairavi is one of those ragas, which they say is Senjuruti. There's another raga, which which is a folk, but we use it in very classical terms. Also, it has a folksy look at it too. So the line does blur when yeah. you start bringing in life into music, because ultimately this is all about the human space, the human spirit, and the human experience. So ragas are nothing more than the everyday representation of the human experience in my book. Maybe there's a raga for, you know, meeting new friends. Yes, and, I'm and sure. coming we together for the first shall time. Shall we try singing together? <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> we could, we could, because, you know, how is your day today? Mm, after all, we can translate right. that into a melody. It's raining. Mm, mm, sure. You know, so that could be a certain set of notes. So there's valor, there's bravery, and there's all these different, really different emotions, but there's also very close, related feelings, thoughtful, deeply thoughtful, pensive. You know, you could get into that space and really start playing around. Ultimately, I may sing it in a certain way, feeling something, but you may experience something quite different from my music. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it's what we perceive and what we take away with us. A friend of mine once said that in this music, Whereas Garrett and I, with a musician, uh, with uh, with an instrument, might play in a key. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In this music, it's more you play in a feeling. Is mm -hmm. that is that what I'm gathering from what you said? There's definitely that. But if you'd really started talking grammar, you will see when I play today, we have what is called the basic tone, a pitch. Mm -hmm. That could okay. be also construed as a key. But the entire concert will be played in that basic tone being Say E is the tonic. Uh -huh. We build the ragas with that yeah, E. Yeah, th I think maybe in the Western tradition we will call that a drone. Yes. Okay. And we, I would love to use that word. I just didn't go there, but that's the drone. Oh, okay. That's really okay, the great. drone. Got it. And yeah. the Indian music's mother, they say, is Shruti, which is the word for drone. Mm. And the father of Indian music, they say, is Laya, which is basic rhythm. Mm. Not a measured six beat, uh, three fourth. It's not that. It's just the rhythm that we all have going in here. And when that heart does not go properly, then we have the opposite of laya, which is avalaya, which is uh, something not okay. Yeah. So Indian music believes that there is order in the universe. And that order, whatever that be, is the basis of the father of the music. So it's a very familial mm -hmm. <laughs> system, mm -hmm. yeah. mother and father and all of that. But they say that because the role of parents is also very highly revered in the society. Mm. The role of the teacher, the guru, mm -hmm. and the role of the parents. The guru is said to be that light which you switch on when you get into a room to see what is in that room. But really that room is you. Without the light, we don't see this room. But just imagine, once we put on the light, I can see the speakers, I can see the microphones and all of that. If we were this room, the guru is that spark that awakens in us what is us, really. They are just awakening who we are. So it is so important to find the right guru to realize ourselves. Mm. I just find this concept so mind-blowing mm. that the guru is remover of ignorance. Gu and ru exactly means that, remover, dispelling darkness, removing ignorance. I'm writing that down. I, I'm, you know, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm getting really moved by... Um, <laughs> 
you know, how you can't separate this music from the culture and yes. from the feeling of, of being a person. Um, and uh, But Patti, I wanted to go back to the idea of playing um, in a mood. How do you, what, what is the relationship between how you feel in a moment and the music you're playing? Can you play a a happier uh, sounding raga if you're if you're actually a little sad or, you, or if you're actually a little angry? What what is the relationship between those two things? Um, actually, when when we are playing with a song, with the song, it's uh, like a happy mood, mm -hmm. or uh, it's very sad, or it's very uh, spiritual. So the raga, they composed with a song that that like mode so same same thing we have to adapt that mode in mm. with our body and fingering everything we, we have to apply for the song so actually in uh, uh, in on the stage uh, we have to play or accompaniment the artist is not only for the thala, not only for the song. Is we have to play for the mo mood of the song and uh, raga and the ambience. Mm. So together we have to absorb it, absorb it, and we have to reproduce with our art. Sure. And, and, you know, Scott, what I'm thinking about right now is that if, you know, I go on stage and play, let's say, a, a Brahms symphony or a Tchaikovsky <laughs> symphony, the way I feel has very little to do with yeah. the notes that, that, that I'm playing. And, and again, I'll say it again, I'm, I'm so moved by um, how, you know, the relationship between body and spirit and mm -hmm. music mm -hmm. and, and setting. It's, it, it's, it's an incredible thing for me to think about. Absolutely. There is a composition we were talking about um, this weekend. I was out in, in a concert in a different state. And we were talking about this piece, which translates to, you're going to laugh when I tell you this, because you've heard this already elsewhere. Um, all the world is a stage. Mm. We are but players. Yeah. And we are mere actors, etc., etc. You know where I'm coming from. Yep. This is not from As You Like It, but this is from a 13th century Indian composer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for clearing that up for us. <laughs> <laughs> Called Andamacharya, who lived in South India. And he wrote about the Supreme. And he said, we are mere actors. The song's melody has been composed in such a beautiful way. I'm just going to randomly sing. Please. I don't have a G on me right now. There's an app for that. Yes, <laughs> yes. I Tanpura. Isn't it Apple? So it's all about the me. I'm going to write that <laughs> down. We, yeah, I Tanpura. Um, it's a much better app than some of the other ones. G sharp kurtrovan. Give me A flat. Yeah, it's morning, so it's better. Uh, Nanati Baduku Nartakamu Kanadi Kanadi Kaivalyamu Nanati Baduku Nartakamu Nartakamu Putu ta yunizamu, o ta yunizamu, putu ta yunizamu, o ta yunizamu, nagi nagi kalamu, natakamu, putu ta yunizamu. Potayu nizamu nagi nagi ni pani natakamu yego vanashri Gaganamumi didi 
I was just using that as an example to say nanati baduku natakamu means all the world is a stage nataka is the word for a play mm. you know kanadi kannadi what we see what we don't see are parts of this play kaivalyamu then he goes on to say phututayu nijamu potayu nijamu nijamu means truth phututayu is we are going to we are born that's the truth both of you is we're going to go that's the truth nagi nagi kalamu what is laughing though because we are playing a game in between is kalam which is time mm-hmm. here's time sitting and laughing at us not <laughs> when we don't realize what is it that we are feeling but what we do know that there is somebody up there maybe pulling the strings and we are merely puppets <laughs> is up there the blue sky is the limit for all of this but i just love i just sang a little bit of that song just to say we are born we have to go but in between what happens is this play and there's time sitting there and having a mighty hearty laugh <laughs> about the whole thing <laughs> and the music that i just sang is poetry from the 13th century in the language telugu most beautiful uh, south indian language there are five six languages in which we sing south indian classic music like classical western music which is sung in so many different languages sure, italian german italian yeah. german french english and yeah. so many other languages so we need to know the language that's important and when we play this song the way it's accompanied as he says mind body and spirit the drummers have to play it in such a way that the rhythm enhances this feeling yes there is almost a feeling of um a very pensive thinking but also something very freeing about this melody i feel that there is an answer there don't feel like you have to take these responsibilities of your actions i almost feel the composer is giving a validation of hey i'm merely a player so i can't really be responsible for my actions okay yeah, <laughs> i that's almost an feel like yeah. there's another perspective to that by saying somebody else is controlling it so in some ways it'd be better if you just surrendered yourself to that being let him take care of you then you will be going mm. you know the right path don't think you are doing anything here you know in some ways there's also that duality of that meaning i think one yeah. of the things as i sat and listened to you sing one of the things that i love about this style of music is the fact that um you know, like in classical music that we're used to and that garrett plays on stage it has corners you know you're supposed to play it a certain way yeah whereas when i heard you singing there were times where it felt like you were in between notes yes. and or at least and in between what we would consider what we would notes, consider yeah. notes and where that might be undesirable in yes. this sort but here it's part of it and i love that aspect of it and and there's also an improvisational aspect Very to it, correct true. i improvised even now oh, in wow. a, in a big way that is so wonderful so that Thank you. It, like um if you were to give two concerts one right after the next they would be so drastically different wouldn't they yes they would be even oh, this piece would be different not in a big way because the basic emotion i have to stay true to the intent of the composer of what he's trying to say here or what he has said and gone many centuries ago but there will be changes here and there i have to say this you said something so beautifully which my professor my teacher professor t r subramaniam of delhi university would be smiling down on you scott now <laughs> because he always said and what garrett said about what we say notes <laughs> i like that too yeah um my teacher always said it so beautifully he's an in indian music is music between notes it is uh. a journey he always would say we're going to take a train in delhi those days we took more trains than planes and we would land in chennai which is madras you know the o- old name was madras it's back to its original original name of chennai which is where i was born we all know that so we start on note a and we are going to go to note z hmm. we know this but we are going to touch so many stations on the way <laughs> so what is this journey like between yeah. this start and this end and then the small station so what happens between journey a delhi and the next uh, station which comes 
some some other station what happens there did you have a coffee did you find tea mm. was the weather was the good? good was the food good because the stations are known for their food too oh, indian okay. railway stations used to be known for specialities so okay you're going to get that so what is your anticipation like you're going to get this really wonderful thing to eat when you reach the next one but how was the journey between the notes mm. so that is the beauty of indian music he says because we all know we are going to go to the airport or play, train, train station and start here and reach there but you know was tsa nice to you today did mm-hmm. they open your baggage did they put it back like you packed it right. these are things i think about in every journey yeah. because i travel with the instrument and my heart is in my mouth most of the time when i'm traveling so, uh, so can you explain for us uh, like a raga some some raga called kalyani or something okay. can um the arogana avarogana and how the curves. you yeah yes would you give me that drone i'll be happy to talk yeah. about it he and, says and while, and while he's pulling the drone you know i'll, yes. I'll just say, you know you, you you talk about your teacher uh smiling down on scott you know my my dear chamber music teacher who who's uh who, who's now gone professor weiss he used to say all the time that music is the space between the notes <sighs> so even the fact that um you know our you know west western music is a little more rigid you know that concept is still there but in in the indian tradition that space is just explored so uh, much more thoroughly yes and i have to say something here garrett i am blown away by western music and i'll tell you why i come from a tradition a classical tradition um that has the very important concept of linear melodic progression which is we do one note as i'm going to demonstrate then go to the next note then go to the next note because we are used to doing this by ourselves we don't have a whole big group of musicians that we work with with a different concept they are all going to be following the path set by the lead if you were listening to what bhupati ji was saying a little while ago he said we have to accompany the mood of that song mm-hmm. and that song is chosen by the person sitting in the center which will be somebody like me playing the veena or singing and the drummers and the violin accompaniment everybody follows that but we're all on that melodic exploration linear so one note at a time we climb like that we don't do this parallel processing as i call it coming mm-hmm. from the computer world <laughs> sure <laughs> in the harmony type of representations mm-hmm. when C is being sung there somebody is doing a B here somebody else is doing a different tone somewhere else on a different instrument like your bassoon wow i love that instrument <laughs> so people do it differently at the same point of time we have sounds coming from different sources that all sound so beautiful together i've always wondered about the mind of those great classical composers of western music on how can they think in these parallel paths and imagine till i became a composer myself i i appreciate it even more now when i write for western instruments because that was not my training oh, so see. i yeah. have to think outside the box and i love that challenge which is how i made my collaborative album last year that released my three the music of friendship when i wrote i had to think of how would pat o'keefe play this on how would it sound on the you know saxophone as opposed to michel kenny on the cello and how will i bring my veena in here to complement them mm. um how will bubdi and play how will temo keith play or if i work with a different classical musician then i'm thinking how are they going to play how is that instrument going to sound i never had to do all that i was selfishly always thinking about my veena and my veena and the sound <laughs> of my veena yeah. and what can i do with my veena now when i think about these compositions i said those composers have to be so good at those different instruments and be masters at them to create such masterful works so i'm i'm saying this because this has always been something that i admire and respect about the classical tradition of the west because it's a completely different paradigm that yeah. it's working from as opposed to the indian tradition which i i simplify by saying you uh, know linear melodic progression of notes I I'd like to ask you a question about collaboration because yes. um I studied slide blues guitar with a a local instructor here named Jeff Ray. Mm-hmm. And um he turned me on to uh an a recording called A Meeting by the River. Have ah. you heard? Is it by Chaurasia? It's uh Rai Kooter and Vishwa Mohan Bhatt. Vishwa Mohan Bhatt. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, yeah. I have I've heard it. Rai Kooter. And that was that was such a discovery. I didn't think about how well a steel guitar from the delta would work mm. with 
your instruments from India. Uh, have you ever made a collaboration with I'm uh, a guitarist to, like that? Yes. I'm trying to remember with who did I play with the steel guitar. I'm trying to remember. I'm, I'm blanking out now. I, I could get you that name very easily, but he was a very, he's from Philadelphia. And when I was in Australia, he used to, he was at that time working for BBC mm. in Perth. Mm -hmm. So we had a session. I'm trying to remember, was it a pedal guitar or a steel guitar that he brought? Yes. To answer your question, Coming back to which guitar that I, I know really well with collaboration is our local Minnesota master, Dean McGraw. Oh, yeah, of course. Dean McGraw and I have played a lot together. Oh, nice. I'm at the Cedar and some other venues. And most recently, we were at the state capitol celebrating Mahatma Gandhi together. Mm. And Dean is a master at mm -hmm. improv and, and a great artist with whom I've had the honor of working. So acoustic guitar, yes. I worked with Steve Call, another fabulous from the... Brass Kings. Yeah. Um, I have worked with uh, Anthony Cox, the master oh, yeah. bass player. Yeah, yeah. And we had a band, have a band called Carnatic Energy. So I have been very lucky. So if I start thinking now, I can start giving you names of people I've worked with. And another instrument um, that blows my mind away is, of course, the saxophone clarinet and the wind family. Mm -hmm. But the guitar is like the Indian cousin um, is the veena. Guitar's <laughs> Indian cousin is the veena. I, I was curious as to how... Um, uh, musicians from our more American tradition would m meld with yours? The the main thing is first, they wish to do it. You know, if somebody right. wants to do it, then they are already realizing what is it that might take mm -hmm. to do. And they are very, very generous in Minnesota. That way is a great place for that. And um, when we sit down to play, the one of the things we talk about is the drone, that philosophy of how I work with the drone and if that can be done. And the second important idea is improvisation or improvisation. Forgive yeah. my accent. I've lived too many places in the world <laughs> to, to have a anything proper, I <laughs> mix and match. But when they improvise, if they like to improvise, then this is the place to go because then a lot of it is improvisation and improvisation. If you you know, in, in, a, you know, in the Western world, especially here in the United States, there's this big struggle and this big push to keep you know, classical music, quote unquote, relevant and to, and to pass it on uh, to the next generation. Is that... Um, an issue in your experience with this music being uh, so closely related to the culture of, of, of South India, it seems like it will always be there considering its history. Yes. And I feel like I should say yes to the answer, but I have to say there's always, a, you know, this big question mark, will this continue? Will this continue? Because we come from we being all of us classical musicians is a smaller group of people. It's already a niche kind yeah. of a group. Yeah. And that's true for Indian classical music too. It's definitely not as popular as Bollywood or you know, India has so many different music making parts of the country. We have Hollywood and Tollywood and all of oh, that okay. in India. <laughs> so it's definitely not in that popularity zone at all. So we are worried about that. But I have to say, it fills me with hope that when I begin teaching and I say I'm ready to take on students, my numbers are forever growing and we have to close registration at some point for private lessons nice. because that tells me that our parents, uh, parents being our community parents, um, are interested in keeping and propagating this art. I have many parents who have come to me who said, we didn't receive this opportunity when we were growing up or we didn't take it seriously enough when it was given to us. So now we want to give our children this opportunity. Will you teach our children? And there's nothing more satisfying than have the next gen perform and sing. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying they all have to become professional musicians like me. That's not very practical because we need an audience too. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, if they found a friend in music then I consider myself very lucky to have given them that taste for a friend for life in music. Yeah. You know, go home and come back from work and pick up your instrument or sing or play the drums or find a safe place for yourself where you can be yourself and come out, come out of it energized and positive to take on the next day. That's all we look for. And I do have to say I have about 10 or 15 young people, including my own daughter, who's my disciple, who have become musicians, boldly become musicians, 
just yesterday we were discussing this uh, when we were sitting in an airport, both with the G and I, about the future. It's a very tough profession, and yeah. I came home and the discussion continued with my husband, because my daughter is studying music and uh, doing a second master's in music, and my husband is like. Are you sure this is going to be sustained? Where is she going to get insurance from and practical sure, things like that? Sure. And um, I don't have answers, but I have faith. And I, I just told him, I'm, not, I'm being foolish maybe in saying this, uh, but Bhuvati Ji said she's a very hardworking kid. She's going to do well in everything because he had the same doubt. When she went to Princeton to study molecular biology, and practically went into music for ma as a major now. That switched. She became a music major with a minor in vocal performance. And mm. of course, she had neuroscience because she wants to connect the brain and music at some point, right? And, but she's a composer, a Minnesota-born, raised composer now mm -hmm. and studying music now. She, that's what she's doing. So we were talking about the practicality of it, Garrett. I know you asked about tradition continuing, but I'm talking more you know, more practically, of course. because I yeah, don't know, life. for real life, I don't know which of my students are going to become professional musicians, but some of them are already telling me they want to. And I have told them, you got to travel a lot, you have to work all the hours, every day is a vacation, every day is a work day. Absolutely, yeah. So yeah, you know. I, can, I know that story. <laughs> I can't tell you the number of composers I've talked about on the air that when they first went to university, they were studying law or right. something else before they switched over. So you tell your daughter <laughs> that there's plenty of famous composers that have all the reverence in the world that were supposed to be a lawyer. Yeah. I mean, I started as an English major myself. There so, you go. Yeah. And my background, if you know, computer science. And mm, right. look at me sitting here and talking about <laughs> music the whole time. So I... I, I truly believe the universe will provide, and I also believe music will provide. I have this faith, and Bhubadhyana always says that. He says, if you work hard, that work ethic, if you have a positive attitude and belief and love with a passion and work with a passion, it's not enough to just love with a passion. <laughs> we got to back oh, it yeah. up with some serious work. Yeah, absolutely. So if we uh, taught uh, or 100 students, mm -hmm. Um, so we are getting out of 100, there will be a two mu musicians and 98 listeners. Sure, <laughs> sure. Which is yeah. so that's important. The, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's I'm, why I'm we not survey <laughs> our music art form. We survive it like that. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Well, well, we're definitely going to listen to some music, but but I have I have one more question. Sure. So, um, Nirmala, when we met at um, the American Composers Forum uh, convening, I remember you talking to me about how important it is not just for uh, the music to have a, a place and visibility, but the traditional dress also to have, <laughs> uh, you know, to be visible. And, and the both of you are, are in a <laughs> traditional dress right now. I, I'm, I'm curious about uh, the importance and the relationship between that and the performance of the music. Absolutely. I believe that um, it's important to look and feel your best first sure. every time. And it's our responsibility when you were in, we're in front of so many people also to represent the art form in every possible manner, visually and uh, musically. And as musicians, as you know, we uh, the dancers, I envy them because they've got this great jewelry and this great costumes. And when they come and stand on stage, the Indian classical ones, or any dancer for that matter, you're just like, ah, oh, this is so beautiful. Because for what it's worth, your jewelry is also very beautiful. Thank you very much. That's so kind <laughs> of you. But the point is that we don't, as musicians, we don't move around. We don't express with, you know, all these great emotions. They use the human body completely. We use it in a different way. We're static. We're sitting on stage. We don't move around much. And I think photographers, when they photo photograph musicians, <laughs> they have to find some really interesting angles. Yeah. But dancers, you can get all of that. So that's the first point, that we need to be dressed in the right way um, because I also believe it's part of the experience. The second thing I believe is when you get dressed like this, we prepare yourself mentally also as oh. you're getting ready for the process. That makes sense, yeah. You know, when um, I even use the example of when you go to church, you, you, you are having a special time, you think, to go and commune uh, as a community and talk to God or by yourself, whatever it is. You light a candle, you light a lamp. It, 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 that act is putting your mind in a different place, I believe. And just like that, getting ready um, and, and looking like, you know, you f you want to perform, and the whole act of getting ready, the ten minutes that you prepare yourself, or fifteen minutes, 
readies you and puts you in the moment mm. of performance. So I believe the clothing and the attire is as much important and a true representation of the culture. And I tell you, Garrett, these are so comfortable. You try sitting in jeans <laughs> and playing the veena. You sit down in jeans and play the veena. I'm not very comfortable with that. I like my loose pants. I don't like tight clothes when I'm sitting down there. So this is extremely comfortable. It's like a skirt. You know, you wrap around some clothing around sure. the skirt. And you sit down and it's very freeing to play. So I think this is also a comfort factor, selfishly. Sure, sure. <laughs> Um, and, and, and before we uh, hear the two of you play a little music, um, if there's someone who has never experienced uh, Indian music before, um, other than, of course, uh, looking up and buying your albums, <laughs> uh, what, what should a person search for? What, 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 is, what would you say is a good starting point? Um, a good one would be uh, to first listen to different instruments of Indian music, including the voice. Um, so go and Google or search on Carnatic music, Indian classical music, put down different instruments. First, look for the names, then find the names, make a note of them, go look for artists playing the veena or playing the Saraswati veena, which is how my instrument is called, or the mridangam or vocal or violin or flute, because you will find a whole list of them. And then when you start listening, then you will start feeling, listen to a few, so there's different styles, so you may not exactly hit the best thing right away. Because as you know, Google doesn't have quality control, so sure. you can just get something and they may not be your best experience. So just Google out these various things, uh, search it out, and then figure out what might appeal to you and start following. Slowly listen, but I, I have to say, go to a concert in person. Sure. Nothing mm. like the live experience. I mean, this conversation, I don't know if it would have happened better uh, in a different way, but except to sit with you and actually talk to you. You know, it's a very different thing watching your faces and saying, uh, you know, whatever you're giving yeah. me in, in assurance or confirmation or you know, I should change my tactics. This is not working. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, I don't know if you've ever met a friendlier audience than what you have this in front of the, you right now. This is the best. <laughs> this is the best. And such an, you know, lovely way to just talk about things. I didn't I didn't come here with any ideas of what we might talk, but you made me feel so comfortable. That's the same thing for an audience member. You go there, sit there, don't have any expectation, just see what you get. And there's enough venues in town in Minnesota and other countries and other places in the States to get live music. So anything go live. You, that is never to be duplicated. That's the beauty of Indian music, too. If you see a YouTube recording, you're going to find somebody talking or playing that day, talking in music, I mean, mm -hmm. of what they felt that moment and somebody's camera capturing that. There's so many variants in there. You didn't get the live experience. So if I were them, I would just... Just head out to a concert hall. I would do that. If okay. I experience, want to experience anything that I've never experienced, I, yes, do my homework, but I, I try and make it to a concert in, or a, a play or whatever it is, but a talking, a reading in person to... Well, I'm ready to experience some of that now. Oh, you're ready to play for you. Nirmala Bhupati, thank you so much. This is, this has been a blessing to me. I've, I've been thank so you. moved uh, by this entire conversation. So thank you so much for the work that both of you are doing. And thank you for uh, coming to sit with us today. Again, namaste. 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 And may namaste. I say namaste. thanks for your show. Your podcast is, is a very popular one among my circles of friends. And I'm just thrilled there's a space for this in our world today. So to both of you, Scott and Garrett. And of course, I'm very honored to be on your show. N nobody could ask for a better Monday morning. We're <laughs> oh, so you. glad to have you. <laughs> Thank so you so glad much. To have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you.